It's now my pleasure to bring our next guest onto the stage. Moderating this session on Capital Markets Crystal Balls is Alan Denenberg of Davis Polk. And Alan is joined by Ben Burdett of JP Morgan and Diana Doyle of Morgan Stanley. They're gonna predict the future, hopefully, and Alan promised me if they have time, he'll tell you what cryptocurrencies to purchase. <laughs> It'll be a short conversation. Thanks, Adam. Uh, glad to see everybody here today. We've got two great uh, prognosticators <laughs> of uh, 2023 with us. And uh, Ben focuses on life science at JP Morgan, uh, heads up their life science ECM. And Diana, to get the other side of it, is, is heads up Morgan Stanley's ECM, tech ECM. So this is a, also a 100-year ex experience here because we've brought the House of Morgan <laughs> back together uh, for the first time in 100 years. So pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting thing. Just to set the stage, I thought, you know, this year is, has been, you know, quite different uh, in capital markets activity than last year. And I thought I'd read what I wrote last year. We were focused on tech at the time. Uh, solely tech, but it, it applies more broadly. I said, uh, the tech sector is often the most innovative in terms of capital raising. We've seen tech companies continue to raise large amounts of cash privately, do traditional IPOs at a record-setting pace, engage in direct listings, merge with SPACs, remember that, and sell themselves to strategics and sponsors. Well, 2022 has been really different. Handful of, really a handful of IPOs limited number of follow-ons from companies that are less valuation sensitive and in need of capital, uh, some SPAC act, limited amount of SPAC activity. So a pretty different year. So um, I thought with that as a stage setting uh, in the sense of things could only get better, um, I'm going to just start it off with, with our, our uh, panelists here. So first I thought I'd start with private capital. Uh, and there's a lot of private capital on the sidelines, both in terms of uh, sponsor private equity, um, and we started to see private equity over the last little while start to invest uh, and have some of that capital come forward. VCs, I'm a little less sure of where their money's uh, going these days, but uh, I did read an article that said uh, the MBA schools should expect an influx of <laughs> young VC bankers whose future was not so bright. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, maybe, Ben, start with you on the, on the life science side. What do you think 2023 will bring in terms of, uh, you know, probably maybe it's more for VC for you, but VC private equity funding and how do they deal with the fact of companies that are viewing valuations and is too low and from an investor perspective, you know, where's the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thanks, Alan. And thanks, everyone. Good, good to be here. Look, I think you hit it, you hit it right. The, there continues to be a lot of dry powder within the private markets, broadly speaking, across private equity and, and venture capital. This has been an important feature of the market, and it's right now providing a needed source of funding while the public market options in the IPO market is really trying to regain its, its footing, uh, which it hasn't fully done to this point. On the earlier side of things within the life sciences area, we continue to see you know, venture appetite for company formation and funding the next wave of science and innovation. Uh, that being said, the approach in terms of investment, uh, asset profile, timeline to public exit, uh, and importantly, valuation is being rethought for the current environment, as so that's ongoing. When you talk about valuation, capitulation, and, and what's going on there, that's probably most relevant for the group of companies that might have raised capital at a much higher valuation in a very different market environment. And there, I'd say we really haven't seen you know, capitulation on a broad scale at this point in time. Many companies have been focused on executing their business, extending runway, streamlining investment, uh, and and monitoring the markets and valuations as they go. You know, depending on what we see in 2023 in terms of uh, valuations and market access, you could see more valuation resets, capitulation, things like that. But so far, it's been fairly limited. Is there something, Ben, that you think triggers that capitulation, or is that? Time. Time, yeah. How much time? I just. Uh... <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. Diana, on the, on the tech side, I'll turn to you on, on that same, same question, really. Yeah, among tech companies, I mean, there's still a tremendous amount of cash out there that VCs raised in 2021. There's over 300 billion in VC dollars on the sidelines. So while we've seen it slow, we haven't seen the pace of investment in the earlier stage companies halt. We're still seeing Series A, Series B get funded at almost similar valuations. We're off the highs, but there's a lot of money and people are chasing good businesses. They're chasing good founders, either founders who've done it before or founders who can surround themselves with an advisory team that has seen a cycle. There's a whole generation of people in the market right now who have only seen things go one way in an economy supported by the Fed. And so if you are a founding team that either has done it or is surrounding yourself by people who can give you that advice, VCs will be backing you. We're also seeing among private equity, there's still a lot of dollars going after these companies that are already public. Uh, they're taking players off the field. We've seen it in tech this year with, with especially Toma Bravo and Vista buying these companies with large checks, very little leverage. Um, leverage will be a constraint in PE continuing to deploy a lot of cash just given how rates have gone up. But um, we're seeing a lot of activity and I think that will continue. We may see some strategics get more involved and become more competitive with private equity firms and going after some of these assets. Um, but for as long as the regulatory landscape in technology is challenging and regulatory approval is not a certain, I think private equity is gonna stay a really, really strong bid. On the valuation point, Alan, yes, companies are reluctant to go raise new money at this new world of valuations, where for software companies, for example, the median valuation is back down to the historical average. Uh, from where we were in 2021. Um, but we're seeing companies start to get more creative. We just did this structure for software company Arctic Wolf that's a convertible debt structure prior to an IPO. It converts to equity at a premium to the IPO price. Now it's a debt structure, it's not the same as going to raise another equity round from your uh, VC community, but um, companies are doing whatever they can to be creative, to avoid locking in a valuation unless they really need the money and uh, to, to access those incremental pools of capital. And in that, in that example you gave, does that company pay interest? Is there an interest component to that debt, I presume? There is a low interest rate uh, yeah. that accumulates over time and it converts at a premium to the IPO price at the time the company goes public subject to a cap. Right, and that's an interesting way to, from the company's perspective to avoid this valuation conundrum of, you know, we're, we're kind of too low, we're not going to sell equity at that price. And how does the, you commented a little bit on uh, the PE firms and the lack of, you know, just say lack of a bond market right now, certainly high yield bonds. How are they, how are they thinking about that debt equity? You know, they, they typically want to be leveraged and, you know, raise debt and all. How is, how is that impacting the choices they make maybe amongst companies or size or how does, how does yeah. that factor in? I, there is a large backlog right now of debt that was committed for, to support private equity transactions, including some technology companies earlier in the year at higher valuations and lower interest rates that needs to work its way through the system. There's over $60 billion of a backlog that's sitting on banks' balance sheets. But there's still appetite from the capital markets to commit to, to support these deals. I think because many of the large strategics are more likely to be on the sidelines, uh, we'll see what happens if Microsoft Activision gets approved and if that opens the door for future large M&A or if that um, doesn't get approved and large M&A isn't there. And then I think you see the PE opportunity for businesses that generate a lot of cash flow, have predictability in earnings, and have low CapEx. I think you, you will continue to see a private equity bid yeah. uh, with leverage. Yep. Let's shift a little to IPOs, Ben. Um, so, you know, in the past couple of years, we've seen, you know, in tech, uh, IPOs where for companies that um, really didn't, weren't profitable, didn't have a lot of sign of profitability, but had a, you know, a path towards growth and revenue in biotech, life science, 
Revenue was never a big part of the program, <laughs> but promising science. And you started to see some pretty early stage biotech companies going where they really didn't have, you know, it wasn't like they were in their phase three trials or had NDAs. Some did, but some were early stage and getting, you know, really good valuations, maybe dependent on people and, and the early stage of the science looked promising, the markets they were going into. Um, what are we going to, in 2023, if the IPO market is to re-pick up, maybe Ben on the life science side, what's it going to take? And particularly in light of, you know, inflation and rising interest rates, you know, weighing on the, on the macro economy, what are, what are, what's, a, what's a company to do? <laughs> what is the kind of company that's going to go public? Yeah, it's, look, it's a, Alan, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's one that you know, we spend in our in our business a tremendous amount of time thinking about you know for for our clients and look the answer is right now we don't really know we know it's not what it was in terms of the bar and we know there's going to be a new equilibrium that we're going to need to identify uh, through uh, you know through a process of investor feedback and capital formation with investors that being said in general um, what we would anticipate would be you know, some of the, the earlier opportunities would be leaders in the field, probably more mature companies, more scale, more resilient business models, more clear path to profitability. You can pick your, your metric that you're focused on. Uh, and then coming out at valuations that are, you know, fit within the confines of the current market environment. Um, it's important to note, whatever that first cluster of IPOs is going to be, it's really important that they help drive confidence in the asset class as a whole that really hasn't provided returns for investors. In healthcare, you know, more than 80% of 2021 IPOs are trading below issue price. So that, that's an issue. Assuming that we can have a representative set of confidence building IPOs, call it in the first half of next year, hopefully, uh, that would help pave the way for, for broader activity and really to, to more carefully interrogate and figure out where some of these bars really belong as we think about what it, what it takes mm -hmm. to be a public company. And that's, I think, right, consistent with the cycle for life science companies that we've seen over, over many years where when things fall apart a little bit in the IPO market, the, I'll lack a better way of saying it, the best companies bring the market back and then eventually you start to bring less you know, over time, um, froth builds and less, you know, less developed, less attractive companies are able to go out. But over time, mm -hmm. that happens, and it always is led by the really strong, yeah. strong companies. And that being said, biotech, as you mentioned, is a little bit of a different animal where earlier stage companies have been raising public capital for a long time. Long time. Again, I think there's an element of where's the new bar, whether that's clinical data, whether that's team, whether that's uh, you know, differentiation of her science or technology. Uh, but these companies fundamentally need capital, and we think they'll be involved, but on different metrics than more of your traditional operating companies that we I was referring to before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diana, how about in, in tech? Well, in tech, I agree with Ben. We want to see the strong companies, the leaders, uh, the, the, to come first. But it's not enough, because we just had that. We just did, it, uh, two weeks ago, an IPO for Mobileye. Uh, the driver assistance technology company owned by Intel, and it checked every box, and it was a big success. It had great margins, strong profitability. It had a addressable market that people believe self-driving cars are a big thing, and there's a lot of future there. It was a company that was public before. Intel bought this company in 2015, so the market knew the company already, had followed it previously, and it had a CEO who had been a CEO of a public company before and had exercised that muscle. On top of that, it had a seller in Intel who wanted to move forward, accepted the valuation, and decided they made a strategic commitment, we're going to sell a portion of this business, and they decided to move forward. Um, so that's the fact pattern that checked every single box, and it was a good success, and it traded up 25%, but it doesn't lead yet to the next IPO. I don't think the next IPO needs to check every one of those boxes, but I think it does need to be in tech. It needs to be growing 40 to 50% or more. I think it needs to be nearly profitable or already profitable if we're talking about software companies. 
um, and it has to be a leader in the field. And I think those are the things investors are looking for. Uh, the company has to also be motivated to move forward now, either because you want a public currency to compensate employees, you've made a strategic decision that you're going to move forward and the valuation is what the valuation is, or you need capital and, and can't afford to wait in the private markets much longer. Yeah. I mean, Intel may have been a, is, is a somewhat unique situation. Mm -hmm. Do you think, and this is probably a broad general generalizing question here, maybe too broad, but do you think boards, you know, have kind of, of private companies who might go public, have they kind of reset their expectations yet as to valuation, or are they still living in <laughs> 2021? I think yeah. we're 70% of the way there. Boards of public companies, management teams of public companies, they're marked to market every day. They see the stock price. The employees feel the pain. There's no way around it. But for private companies, for the first six months of 2022, there was definitely a, a serious level of denial that the market had, in fact, reset and a, a view that there were two different markets. Now I think everyone has realized there's not a private market and a public market. There's one market. And um, expectations have started to normalize. But so many companies raise money in 2020 and 2021 that they're not forced into the market to really test that valuation. Some investors are marking it to market, but the reason it's only 70% and not 100% of the way there is uh, there are a lot of companies who can still go another 12 to 18 months without having to really think about the valuation. Yeah. And Ben, is that similar and how's biotech different in that way? Are people, the need for capital for you know a lot of life science companies is yeah. huge. So that may, I don't know if that drives a difference in terms of how they, you know, how they uh, position themselves relative to va valuation being critical, I'm going to wait versus I need the money, I got to go. I think, I think it does. Uh, you know, it, it, there's been more activity in life sciences this year as a result of that. There's been, you know, it's not a tremendous amount of IPOs, but there's been 10. Uh, nine of them have been biotech companies. You know, all of them have been you know, executed in a way with support from existing shareholders, crossover investors, in a way where the valuation and the completion of the financing is relatively de-risked. Uh, with some of the themes in mind that were mentioned around desire for continued access to capital um, that would in, in, in an optionality for being a public company. Biotech companies are going to continue to find different ways to raise capital just given their, their financial structure and their needs. So we th expect that will continue. What we are seeing, though, uh, is you know, a little bit more, okay, we'll wait for the next window to open and a little bit more thought around what are my company-specific milestones that are going to drive value for me. Maybe that will help me earn my way into a previous valuation um, or, or do better in the public markets. So this is you know, conversa the type of conversations we're having right now, yeah. which, which leads us towards probably a more distributed calendar of activity that's more company specific as opposed to, okay, we've turned the calendar to next year and now, it's, mm -hmm. now something's different. Yeah. Let's shift for a second, uh, and maybe this feels like, almost feels like ancient history a little bit, and talk about SPACs. Dana, I mean, in the SPAC market, we were all you know, a little bit it was a kind of spat crazy a year ago, and now it's, you know, the, the bloom certainly off the rose uh, on SPACs. But they may not go away altogether. What, what do you, how, what's your thinking about where do SPACs go from here? So there were 613 SPACs last year. That was too many. <laughs> there should not have been 613 new companies going public and not in that way. Um, so this back market is quiet. I expect it's going to continue to stay quiet for 24, maybe even 36 months. Um, what we have learned from the huge ramp in SPAC activity in such a short period of time is that the public investors are the public investors who will ultimately be making a decision on the company. And so whether you go public through a SPAC or whether you go public through an IPO, it is the same investors who are going to be making judgments. And, and many of the SPACs who went public in the last year are, are underperforming. They don't have the liquidity in their shares. They don't have the following um, of a broader shareholder base on top of a challenging overall market and a weakening economy. 
So I don't know, I look at 2008, the commercial mortgage market was dead in 2008, but it came back a couple of years later and investors, when they see an opportunity to make money, will reemerge. And I think the SPAC market is gonna follow a similar path. I think SPACs still have a place. They can make sense when you have two companies who wanna merge and don't wanna prepare pro forma financials. That makes sense there. It makes sense if you've got a company who needs the support of a strong sponsor management team. Um, but I think the applicability of it for, for most companies is going to be much more narrow. Yeah. And Ben, how about in life science? I think there were probably, I'm guessing, fewer in life science than there were in maybe some other verticals. But there were certainly some. And we even worked on some together. Uh, what do you think? Is that in life science, is that still an alternative for people to think about, for uh, boards to think about? I think it's pretty similar. You know, as it stands right now, the market is incredibly challenged as it relates to capital formation, performance, regulatory overhang. Just name, name you, you name the challenge, and that's that's likely to persist for some period of time. Uh, you know, where it was most broadly applied within life sciences was the concept of overcapitalizing very early companies uh, with you know, an expectation of, of high potential multiple years out. You know, given how investor perception of risk has changed, execution risk, business model risk, technology risk, and the fact that it's not as good of a capital formation vehicle right now, that's really going to put a damper on, you know, that type of activity. And we've even seen a lot of the leading life sciences public investors who were sponsoring some of these vehicles, you know, pull back. Um, you know, that being said, uh, you know, we, we continue to think it probably has a role. There's probably a next iteration of the product. There were some sponsors who were pretty good uh, at, at identifying assets and getting deals done, and some investors who they built a track record with that uh, you know, we think will probably be in play in the future, but probably not the immediate term. Yeah, yeah. We've been talking, you know, generally about life science and about tech, as we think about next year, maybe taking it one level down, maybe we'll start with you, Ben, in life science. What do you think are the verticals within life science, and then I'll ask you, Diana, within tech, that might lead the way in terms of being uh, most active in capital markets, but you'd say IPOs in the in 2023? Sure. Are there some, you know, are there some that are uh, more in front of others? Yeah, and I'll, I'll get to IPOs in one second. I do think where we've been spending the most time, at least within life sciences right now, is figuring out how to fund and finance existing public companies mm -hmm. uh, that were maybe built into the public markets on a different set of assumptions as it relates to valuation, as it relates to uh, you know, CapEx and burn. And so there are some real financing needs there. And so that's been a major theme. So more, we think about more... Um, you know, follow-on financing is additioning companies raising additional capital. Uh, as we think about the IPO market, uh, it sounds like a brown, broken record, but you can't talk about capital formation, capital needs, and IPOs in healthcare without talking about biotech. The need, you know, the company formation is on the greatest scale. You've got the largest pool of dedicated capital on the venture side and on the public market side. Uh, you've got the most robust and acute financing needs. That's going to be a part of the equation, and, and, and also a way of executing deals that is you can somewhat control execution risk. Uh, stepping back from there, for us at least, it doesn't feel like it's really subsector or vertical driven. Mm. It's really this um, you know push pull on, on valuation and then profile of company that's going to define define where the the activity come from. There's a pretty substantial pipeline of companies that we're thinking go, about going public this year. 2023 and 2024, really across all of the verticals, it's really about finding those, that first wave of companies that can um, check the right amount of boxes mm -hmm. to be successful in the IPO market. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in, in tech, I think it's likely to be led by software, software businesses, particularly things in cybersecurity where the, the enterprise demand is resilient throughout the cycle. Um, I think it's going to follow, that may not be in 23, it could be in 2024, by consumer internet businesses. 
when we look back at what happened in 08, consumer-related tech companies and, and non-tech consumer companies, they were the first to suffer on the way down as the consumer started to feel the pain of rising interest rates and um, job losses, unemployment, home prices coming down. But then they were also the fastest on their way out to recover. So I think we will see that again with consumer internet companies, that once the Fed reaches its peak, maybe that's you know first couple months of 2023, once we see unemployment peak, then we can wait for the consumer to start to become resilient, um, whether that takes six months, maybe it takes longer. Um, but then I think you can see businesses will have a lot more confidence in predicting how the consumer behaves. Uh, right now, for a lot of consumer-related tech companies, you have so much noise. COVID messed up consumer behavior. Now we're in this recovery where consumers are spending more. The top 20% of um, earners in the United States spend 40% of the uh, spending on consumer goods, and the unemployment is low. Those people still have their jobs. Their loans are, are typically fixed rate. Right? They're not exposed yet to what the Fed has done, and so that part of the consumer is going to stay resilient. But we have to see that consumer crack and recover before I think you see internet-enabled uh, consumer companies really come out. Yeah, and I take it no difference between goods and services on, on that side, just general consumer spending? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, last, uh, last question here. We're almost <laughs> out of time. Just trying to figure out how much free time I'm going to have next year for <laughs> vacations and the like. Any, I'm going to ask you for any departing thoughts and prognostication about are we going to have a busy capital markets overall? What's it going to look like next year? You can take it, Ben. I don't hide. I see you trying to hide. <laughs> Look, we would never want to interfere with your well-laid vacation plans, <laughs> which I'm sure are fantastic. But look, we're in some ways we're we're designed to be this way. But we're cautiously, cautiously optimistic, and we set a low bar. So we we think there will certainly be more activity next year than we saw last year. That's a, a maybe an easy way to put this. Now. <laughs> In what form that takes uh, and what that looks like, I think we, we do have a lot to learn. Uh, and the macro environment, as we talked about, is going to be really important to defining some of the market windows we think could exist. So it's hard to put specific timelines. Do we see a little bit more of a rebuilding in the first half and then more activity in the second half? It really depends. Uh, but, we, but we think there's a path, and we think that the longer that we continue to season at these valuations, expectations mod moderate needs from a financing point of view go up, you're just going to have more intersection between where company issuers are willing to raise capital and where investors are willing to buy. Uh, that being said, just to pick on the last point, volatility, uh, although we hope it goes down, uh, is likely here for some period of time. Mm -hmm. Right to continue, and so we could have windows where, or times where, this is not a straight line recovery. There's windows of opportunity. There's windows where things are closed. So we're generally talking to companies about being prepared, having a plan A, and an, an array of other options at their disposal, so that they can be more nimble and access capital when it's available. Yeah, and and I think in tech, we had 120 tech IPOs in 2021. In 2022, we had two. 2023, hopefully, is somewhere in between. <laughs> but I think we need to see three things in order for that market to become healthy. We need to see, uh, number one, a confidence in 2023 and 2024 numbers. That comes with number two, which is the Fed needs to get to peak rates, and the market needs to feel confident the Fed is done because you can't plan your 2023 numbers, 2024, if you don't know what the consumer is doing, you don't know how enterprises are spending. So we need both of those things to happen. The Fed needs to get it over with, and companies need to be able to see the impact of the Fed and react and build that into their numbers. And then the third thing I think we need is a reflation of multiples in the public markets. Because like what Ben said, there, if you are an investor right now and you have a broad policy, you can go buy things in the public markets that are historically cheap. Right, the, right now, uh, an IPO is a stock picker's market. Right? You're betting on an individual company. Right now, the market is trading entirely with the macro. So you're not paid as an investor to invest in an IPO today 
um, because it, you are going to be overrun by what happens by the Fed and geopolitical and everything else. So we need those public companies to start performing in order for there to be more differentiation and to bring people back with enthusiasm towards the IPO product. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. But I, I want to thank Diana and Ben for uh, for joining us. Thank all of you. You know, I think next year we're it's going to be better. We're sure <laughs> yeah. of that. So, thanks, everybody. Thank you.